Hello and welcome to the Canadian Digestive Health Foundation's presentation on living successfully with GERD. My name is Catherine Mulvale and I'm the Executive Director for the CDHF. Thank you for joining us for this special session on living successfully with GERD. We are the foundation of the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology. We're supported by physicians and, and scientists who specialize in digestive health and disease and it's our mission to empower people like you to take control of your digestive health with confidence and optimism. Before we get into the presentation, I wanted to quickly go over some logistics that may be helpful. Please note that the slides will advance automatically. If you want to enlarge the slides, click the Enlarge Slide button located above your presentation window. If at any point you should need technical assistance, simply click on the Help button. If your screen freezes or the slides do not appear to be advancing as they should, please try exiting and restarting the session as it may be a problem with your connectivity. You can ask a question at any time using the box on the left-hand side of your screen. Now, let's get on with the presentation. Our objectives this evening are, first of all, to welcome you and let you know that as someone who's living with GERD or the symptoms of GERD, you're not alone and that there are solutions to help you. Next, we'd like to introduce you to an individual who is living successfully with GERD and a gastroenterologist who has a special interest in this disease. And finally, we want to answer your questions. The Foundation would like to thank Takeda Canada for sponsoring this event with an unrestricted educational grant. Takeda is a valued supporter of the Foundation, and without their support, the session would not be possible. We have approximately 100 participants registered for tonight's session. Most of you sent in questions when you registered. It's our goal to answer most of your questions tonight. If we do not answer your question during the formal presentation, or you have additional questions, you may ask them by typing them in the box at the bottom of your screen and clicking on Submit. We will be able to see your questions and will answer as many as possible. The session will be recorded and it will be available on our website at www.cdhf.ca so that you can review the information when it's convenient for you to do so. In addition, we will also be creating a question and answer sheet that you will be able to review on our website at any time. We hope to provide each of you with valuable information so that you can use that you can use in your everyday life when you're speaking with your physician and when you're making decisions about your health. So let's get into the program so that you can start living successfully with GERD. We have two speakers this evening ready to share their insights and expertise with you. First, you will hear from Sean Richards. He is a 45-year-old man who has had symptoms of GERD for about 30 years. Before being diagnosed, GERD was a terrible irritant that affected his sleep and social life. These symptoms worsened progressively over time. Early on, before Sean had seen a physician, he thought he just had to live with the symptoms. However, with a diagnosis, understanding better lifestyle choices and appropriate treatment, he now has had his GERD under control for about six years and says life is much better. Sean has joined us tonight to share his experience with you. Welcome, Sean. Thank you, Catherine. It's, uh funny reading all the attendees a lot of you have submitted questions uh, and related some of your experiences and it's a bit like a, me a walk down memory lane for me many of the experiences that that uh, many of you are suffering with uh, and, and going through with your lifestyle are things that were a, a regular part of my life for about 20 years and it was only really a fluke that uh, tweaked me into making some changes that were dramatic and and life altering in many ways certainly lifestyle altering I, I tried for many years, um, as, I, I, as it, I was afflicted with it from my early, uh, late teens, I just, something I kind of grew up with and thought there wasn't much you could do about. I had uh, some investigations done when I was a teenager and people told me the, the things that a lot of you relate, keep your, tilt your bed up at night, try to avoid acidic foods and drinks. But after a while, it seemed to get worse and worse. And of course, as you get older and you want to have a glass of wine with a meal or you want to be up late night and, and, and having a drink or something to eat, it, it starts to impair your lifestyle and then it starts to impair your sleeping. And it becomes something that you slowly over time, it slowly over time morphed your, life, your lifestyle and uh, you kind of put up with it. I was lucky enough to be part of a study that was going on that uh, gave me information and insight into what was happening uh, with the GERD, and a chance to try medication that worked very well for me. And many of you have tried various medications, and some, some of you I've noticed have said that it doesn't work well for you. I can only state that certainly 
<clears throat> I'm not free of the problems, but it, it's so easily controlled with me with medication that I, I do find that my lifestyle is not as hampered as it used to be. And it's important to keep in touch with your physician and to bring issues up with your physician on a regular basis since I've learned how many things had changed over the 20 years that I had last bothered to talk about it with a doctor. And now I uh, regularly try to, to look around to see what inf new information is out there, what's happening with drugs, with um, remedies, herbal remedies, other things that might, that might uh, work, that might be worth trying. At the end of the day, uh, it, was, it was critical for me to, to have a sense of that, uh, to have that awareness to um, what was going on and, how, and the small changes I could make as well as the big changes I could make, since it, it, it certainly seems that not everyone is going to benefit from one particular method, either of medicine or of uh, lifestyle changes. And as, I, as, as I've seen in a lot of the questions that have been put up already, a lot of people have tried a lot of things, and it's, it's really a matter of not giving up um, until you find something that can work for you. Um, I had always thought that there was nothing that really could be done short of surgery, and I've learned that now I don't really have to, to, to worry about going down that route, perhaps. Uh, one other issue was that it was very much more serious than I thought, beyond the lifestyle, beyond the pain. It was a serious issue that um, a condition, a precancerous condition like Barrett's syndrome was, was, was developing, and thankfully that was identified, and, uh, and, and within weeks, um, things uh, within certainly within months things had changed dramatically as a result of taking steps successful steps to to make a change in that. I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have, but I just want to end with saying that uh, take taking uh, control of your life means being aware of all of the options out there, asking the questions, and especially following up with your physician to, to uh, learn if there's anything new that might help you. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Sean. That's great. Next, we'd like to welcome our expert, Dr. David Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong is a specialist in gastroenterology who's had a particular interest in GERD and Barrett's esophagus for over 20 years. While he continues to see GERD patients regularly in his clinic, Dr. Armstrong's interest in GERD has allowed him to lead or assist in many national and international research studies and working groups that have resulted in published guidelines on the diagnosis and treatment of GERD. Dr. Armstrong says his work has provided him with a deeper understanding of GERD and its impact on quality of life for millions of Canadians. This understanding has, prom has prompted his involvement in many educational programs for the general public, patients and healthcare professionals to raise awareness of GERD and to pr improve management of the disease. Dr. Armstrong hopes to share some of his insights with you tonight and show how an improved understanding of GERD can lead to lifestyle changes and treatments that offer better disease control and a better quality of life. Welcome, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you very much indeed, Catherine, and uh, thank you also to Sean for giving his, uh, as it were, personal perspective on gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, as you'll see from the slide in front of you, I actually wanted to cover a number of areas this evening related to gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, and I wanted to start out by giving some of the background uh, about why GERD develops, uh, because I think with an understanding of why reflux occurs, it's possible to make decisions for yourself about how to try and improve your life. Um, moving on from that, I then want to talk about some of the potential triggers to reflux disease and to symptoms, um, possible complications, which Sean mentioned, um, the uh, development of Barrett's esophagus and what that means in the long run. We'll then talk about some of the solutions. Um, Medications uh, are obviously important for a proportion of people, but they can be supplemented by other lifestyle choices and lifestyle measures that make life much more manageable. And then that really leads in to how best to deal with what really is a chronic condition and how to minimize the effects so that you can enjoy the rest of life because reflux disease really should not be messing up your life or impairing your quality of life. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background about gastroesophageal reflux disease and to point out, as I think Catherine and Sean said, which is that if you have reflux disease, you're by no means alone. Um, 
Gastroesophageal reflux disease is the most common acid-related disorder in Canada, and by acid I mean uh, stomach acid. Um, and it has significant effects on people's quality of life personally and also has significant effects from a society point of view. Uh, reflux patients are absent from work for about 16% of each year due to their symptoms, and these are data that we have from collecting data around Canada. That's a workforce productivity loss of 1.7 billion hours, so the effect on the economy and society is huge. On average, about 5 million Canadians experience heartburn or acid regurgitation at least once a week, and as we'll see later, those are the major symptoms or the most common symptoms of reflux disease. So that means that one in six Canadians has, um, has reflux disease. If you go to, you know, if you go to um, a ball game and there are 100,000 people there, that means that there are about 15 to 20,000 people in the stands who have reflux disease. People with chronic symptoms, either reflux disease or ulcer disease, acid-related disease, are uh, um, absent from work about uh, eight to ten times more often than healthy people, and it has a significant effect on productivity. Uh, patient concerns and treatment about indigestion cost the Canadian healthcare system about half a billion dollars a year, and the annual sales of prescription and over-the-counter antacids, anti-ulcer medications and reflux drugs is about $2 billion a year. Now, the aim in saying that is not to say that we shouldn't be spending that, but to point out that it is an important condition which bears recognition for the effect that it has for those who suffer from reflux disease and also for the rest of society. And as I say, the major part to this is understanding what is reflux disease, what are the symptoms that it causes, as we've seen from the questions and I've seen, how do I know that I have reflux disease, and then understanding why it is that this occurs. And for most of us, the uh, way that we know how we have reflux disease is because we get symptoms. And the most common reflux symptoms or GERD symptoms are firstly heartburn and secondly regurgitation. Heartburn, it's a funny term because um, although it's commonly used, it doesn't affect the heart and unless you've had burning, you don't know that it's burnt. But the term is heartburn and it's a burning feeling in the chest at the bottom end of the chest or upper part of the abdomen that may rise up towards the neck or to the back of the throat. Regurgitation is often associated with this, but regurgitation is a feeling of stomach contents rising up into the back of the throat or the mouth. So there's often not just a burning, there is a feeling of liquid there or a taste from food that's come up from the stomach. So all those are, those are the most common symptoms of reflux disease. They're by no means the only symptoms, and many people have other symptoms as well or may only have symptoms that are not recognized as heartburn and regurgitation. So some people with reflux disease experience a sour taste in the mouth. Some people just have a burning feeling either at the top, at the back of the throat, or lower down in the upper part of the abdomen below the rib cage. Reflux disease can cause pain without burning, so chest pain that some people feel is like a heart attack can also be due to reflux disease, and it can cause stomach pain that people may think is dyspepsia or even ulcer pain. The other thing that we're realizing is that reflux disease doesn't just produce local symptoms, it can also produce more general effects, and we're realizing that it has a significant effect on sleep patterns for many people. It may be that it wakes people up with typical symptoms of heartburn or regurgitation, so they wake up in the middle of the night with this burning sensation. Or it may be that with stomach contents trickling up or regurgitating into the back of the throat, it can produce a cough or shortness of breath or even a choking feeling. In other cases, it just disturbs people's sleep so that they feel tired and worn down the next day without them realizing precisely why this has happened. So you can see that reflux disease actually covers a number of different symptoms, and you need to be aware of these so that you can decide how best to try and manage them. So we know what reflux disease causes in the way of symptoms, and that really then takes us on to the next question, which is what is reflux disease? And reflux disease is a medical term, or gastroesophageal reflux disease is a medical term for a condition in which liquid or food in the stomach moves upwards or refluxes from the stomach back up into the esophagus, and it may just go a few inches up, or it may go right the way up to the back of the throat. 
and that's how it causes symptoms and can cause injury or inflammation in the esophagus. So this is gastroesophageal reflux disease or reflux or reflux disease. And we diagnose reflux disease if people have evidence of injury or inflammation in the esophagus. Uh, the most common things that we see if there is an abnormality are what are called erosions. That's called erosive esophagitis, where there are like mini ulcers or micro ulcers at the bottom end of the esophagus due to the effect of acid and or pepsin, a digestive enzyme from the stomach that causes irritation and damage to the esophagus. As time goes on, the injury caused by the acid and pepsin can lead on to larger ulcers. It can lead to scarring when the ulcers heal, which can cause narrowing of the esophagus. And sometimes these areas can become badly ulcerated and may bleed. Sean mentioned earlier one of the longer-term complications, a condition called Barrett's syndrome or Barrett's esophagus. And this is where the esophagus responds to injury by healing with a different type of cell or a different type of lining uh, that looks a little bit different. We can see it at endoscopy when we examine the esophagus. And the presence of this change in lining to the esophagus indicates that there has been serious damage to the esophagus and can be a long-term risk factor in a small proportion of patients for the development of cancer or a tumor in the esophagus. So this is esophageal cancer that occurs in a very small proportion of patients, but does occur with long-standing severe gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now about 50% of people, about half of the people with reflux symptoms or reflux disease have some of the signs of injury that I've just described. But most people just have symptoms. That is, they have the heartburn or regurgitation and we consider this to be gastroesophageal reflux disease rather than just heartburn if those symptoms interfere with your daily life. So if they interfere with your eating, your work, recreation, or sleep, if those symptoms are occurring more than once or twice a week, then that is generally considered to be gastroesophageal reflux disease. That is, the reflux is causing enough problems to make your life miserable. So why do we get gastroesophageal reflux disease. And to understand that, it's helpful to know the structure or the anatomy of the esophagus and the stomach um, in normal life when we're healthy. So in health, when there's no problems, the esophagus is the food tube that carries food from the back of the mouth down to the stomach. It goes through the chest, and at the bottom end of the chest, it goes through a hole in the diaphragm called the hiatus. And that's where the esophagus becomes the stomach. So when we eat food, it goes down into the stomach, and that's where it then gets mixed with the stomach that acts as a sort of reservoir. And the stomach mixes food with acid and pepsin to start digestion of the food and to kill bacteria that would otherwise cause problems further down the gastrointestinal tract. Now, between the esophagus and the stomach, at the level of the diaphragm, where the esophagus goes through the diaphragm, there is a thickening of the muscle wall of the esophagus that is called the lower esophageal sphincter, or LES. And this is a muscular ring that acts like a valve between the esophagus and the stomach. And most of the time, when we're going about our daily lives, this valve, the lower esophageal sphincter, stays closed, and this stops stomach contents, food and acid, and all sorts of other things from coming back up into the esophagus. The only times normally that it will open is if you're swallowing. So if you sit down to eat or you sit down to have a drink, then as you start swallowing, the lower esophageal sphincter, this valve, opens up automatically and stays open so that the food will then go down into the stomach. And once the esophagus has cleared, this valve will then close off to stop the food going back up again. The other time that this valve opens is if you start to feel full or bloated. So if you get gas build up in the stomach and it's feeling full, then the stomach can sense this and it tells the valve to open up so that the excess gas, the increased pressure can escape. And that's when you either get a little bit of gurgling behind your chest bone or if you're like my children, they burp loudly to get rid of the gas. Um, the other time that this valve opens is if we feel nauseated or feel we're going to throw up because obviously if we're trying to throw up and get food out of the stomach quickly, then that valve needs to open. The other thing that helps to stop stomach contents coming back up into the esophagus or refluxing is the diaphragm because, as I said, the esophagus goes down through the diaphragm, and in normal circumstances, 
if we breathe or cough, then the muscle in the diaphragm contracts and it actually tightens up around the lower esophageal sphincter and provides an extra barrier that stops reflux at those times when pressure in the stomach increases because we're coughing or bending over or doing some physical activity. So that's what happens in health when the esophagus and the stomach are behaving normally and the valve only opens when it needs to and it prevents reflux. And the next slide shows some of the things that I've described in this diagram. Over on the left-hand side, you can see a front view of the abdomen with a skeleton. You can see the ribs up at the top, and there's a green circle within which you see a little bit of red up at the top, which is the liver. And then over on the right-hand side, there is the stomach. And that's over enlarged over on the right-hand side of the diagram. And what you can see is the tube that comes down at the top end of the diagram, which is the esophagus, and you can see this thickened area, which is the muscular ring or lower esophageal sphincter, which is at the same level as those purple lines that are intended to represent the diaphragm. So that's the diaphragm surrounding the lower end of the esophagus at the level of the lower esophageal sphincter, and here it's closed so that anything in the stomach below uh, will not come back up easily into the esophagus. And you can see below that the stomach is like a bag that holds on to food and mixes it with acid, and then at the bottom end there's a little narrowing, uh, or the pylorus, which is where the stomach lets food out into the duodenum. And once it's into the duodenum, that's where it goes on to become digested. So the stomach is the reservoir which holds the food, and this lower esophageal sphincter is designed to try and prevent most of the food and acid coming back up into the esophagus and back up into the mouth. So in reflux disease, this anti-reflux mechanism isn't working properly. And that usually occurs because the LES, this lower esophageal sphincter valve, does not work properly. And that may be because it's weak, the muscle has become partially paralyzed and it doesn't close properly, or more commonly because it opens too often or it opens at the wrong time. Uh, and so we're not really sure why this happens in people, but sometimes this can happen because there is too much in the stomach, or it may be that the stomach is oversensitive to gas in the stomach so that when it gets a little bit stretched, it'll open up and let not just air back up, but it also allows acid and food to come up, and that's when one gets damaged to the esophagus. In addition to the LES, I mentioned the importance of the diaphragm. So sometimes if there's a problem with the diaphragm, it won't be able to squeeze properly around the lower esophageal sphincter. And that happens particularly if somebody develops a hiatus hernia. And a hiatus hernia happens when the fibrous tissue that holds the lower esophageal sphincter in place becomes weakened, and that allows the esophagus to shorten a little bit, and it pulls a little bit of stomach up into the chest and separates the lower esophageal sphincter from the effect of the diaphragm. So the two parts of the anti-reflux valve are then separated and they don't work as well. Occasionally, reflux can be worse if the esophagus doesn't contract properly, so it doesn't clear food and acid back down into the stomach properly. And sometimes also we can have worse reflux disease because the stomach doesn't empty properly. And if that happens, then food and acid stays in the stomach for a longer period of time and is therefore more likely to go back up into the esophagus. And that's particularly a problem if one eats late at night, because at night time digestion slows down, and if there's food and acid in the stomach and we then lie down, and the valve isn't working properly, then the food will go back up into the esophagus. Some people who have diabetes, sugar diabetes or diabetes mellitus, may have slow stomach emptying, and that can make them more liable to developing reflux disease. So the next diagram that we can look at shows what happens if the stomach is full, over on the left-hand side, you can see this diagram of the stomach, which has got a lot of liquid and food at the bottom. And you can see there's a green arrow, which is being diverted off to the right. And that's because the lower esophageal sphincter, that muscular valve up at the top by the diaphragm, is closed. And therefore, the liquid and gas isn't going back up into the esophagus. The enlarged view on the right-hand side, however, shows that when that valve is open, then the arrow is pointing up and is going up into the lower end of the esophagus and it allows acid and uh, pepsin and food to go up into the bottom part of the esophagus where it causes irritation, inflammation, and burning or pain. So this is what happens in about half of the people with gastroesophageal reflux disease. The stomach contents have gone back up into the esophagus and have caused these little areas of erosions or damage 
that are what we see if we do investigations with endoscopy for reflux disease. So I told you some of the mechanisms about why we develop gastroesophageal reflux disease, but that doesn't really tell us why reflux happens at some times and not others, or why we get symptoms at some times and not others. And so there are a number of things from a lifestyle point of view, from a diet point of view, that can make reflux worse. And I want to go through some of those over the next couple of slides. Now, in describing these, this is not to say that reflux disease is your fault or that it is these things that have caused the reflux disease. What we're looking at are things that will make your reflux worse or may make them worse if you already have that tendency to develop reflux. So there are a lot of studies now that show, for example, that as we become heavier, we become more likely to get reflux disease, and there are big studies across North America and across the Western world showing that as the population tends to become heavier, so the likelihood of reflux disease becomes greater. I mentioned before that eating late in the evening and eating just before going to bed uh, can increase the likelihood of reflux at nighttime. And at nighttime when we're sleeping and we're lying down, anything that refluxes into the esophagus is likely to hang around for a longer period of time and is more likely to cause symptoms, to cause sleep disturbance, and to cause damage. Anything which increases pressure in the abdomen, strenuous exercise, bending, stooping, heavy lifting, all of these are things that increase the pressure in the stomach and can therefore increase the likelihood that acid will come back up into the esophagus. And in fact, stress can also make reflux more likely and can make the symptoms worse. Now, it's not that any of these is the single cause of reflux disease, but they do play a role sometimes in making the symptoms worse. And if we know this, then we have a way that we can try and make symptoms less common or less troublesome. Many of us want to know what it is that we're eating and is it our diet that is causing the problems. And again, there are no good studies to show that particular diets make reflux disease happen, but there are clearly foods that are likely to make the lower esophageal sphincter weaker or to make it relax more often, and these are likely, therefore, to make reflux symptoms worse. And some of the foods, therefore, that we need to be careful about are things like chocolate, peppermint, citrus fruits and juices, uh, tomatoes, or onions, particularly raw onions, garlic, spices, tea, coffee, alcohol, and fizzy drinks. These are all things that can make symptoms worse. Now, again, it's not that these have to be avoided completely, um, but one needs to know that they do cause some of the symptoms, or they can do, and therefore how to adjust what one eats, when one eats, and how much one eats to try and reduce the likelihood of having symptoms without making life truly miserable. Other things that can affect reflux or make it more likely are some of the medications that we take for other conditions. There are conditions called antispasmodics, which are used for colic or for spasm in the bowel. Uh, things like buscopan can relax the lower esophageal sphincter and make reflux more likely. Some antibiotics can make reflux more likely. And some of the osteoporosis medications, what are called bisphosphonates, things like um, uh, resedronate or alendronate, Fosamax, uh, can uh, make reflux more likely or can damage the esophagus. And then some of the supplements, vitamin supplements, sometimes iron supplements and potassium supplements. Pregnancy is associated with an increased risk of reflux symptoms and reflux disease, but it usually settles down after the baby's born. We talked previously about a hiatus hernia. So Many people have a hiatus hernia, and whilst that doesn't always cause reflux disease, the change in the anatomy that occurs with a hiatus hernia makes reflux more likely. And it can sometimes occur, for example, after injuries. Somebody who's had a severe uh, pneumonia with lots of coughing can cause damage at the bottom end of the uh, esophagus related to damage to the sphrenoesophageal ligament, and there are a number of other conditions that can lead to reflux disease. Having said all of that and given you these long lists, it's unfortunate, I have to say, that we really don't know why most people get reflux disease. We aren't able to point at a particular cause for most people and say, that is why you have your reflux. Despite that, there are ways to try and deal with it, and that's what I hope to talk to you about later on. Now, many of us get heartburn, um, and occasional heartburn actually is not reflux disease. If we go out and have a big meal or we have uh, 
uh, a little too much wine, then that can cause some of the burning sensations that uh, are associated with and typical of heartburn. But if it only occurs occasionally, that doesn't mean that you have reflux disease, and generally it doesn't mean that you have any risks associated with reflux disease. Reflux disease is uh, diagnosed when people develop what are called troublesome symptoms, that is, symptoms that occur two or more times per week, symptoms that are severe, uh, for example, chest pain that interferes with daily life, and symptoms that suggest that there might be complications. So complications suggest that sometimes, not always, but sometimes reflux disease can be more serious. Um, clearly, troublesome reflux symptoms are common. I told you before that about 5 million Canadians have gastroesophageal reflux disease, and certainly not everybody with reflux disease has complications or problems. The erosions that I told you about occur in about a half to one-third of patients with reflux disease, that is, patients with typical symptoms, and generally these are not a problem because they will heal very well with prescription medication. A smaller proportion of people develop the other complications that I told you about, ulcers, scarring, and bleeding, uh, but that's only about 1 in 10 to 1 in 20, between 5 and 10 percent of people with reflux disease. And Barrett's esophagus is even less common. That's probably about 3 to 5 percent of people who have gastroesophageal reflux disease. Cancer of the esophagus is even less common. Um, it is certainly not one of the most common cancers in Canada, but it probably occurs in about 1 in 10 patients over their lifetime if they have Barrett's esophagus. Recent studies suggest that good treatment of Barrett's esophagus will actually reduce the risk of cancer developing. So again, this is not something that people need to get panicked about, but it's important, and as Sean said, it's important to discuss this with your physician so that you know that you're being treated appropriately. And this next slide here is a diagram of the lower end of the esophagus, and you can see this slightly purplish area at the bottom end of the esophagus, which indicates the change in the lining in the esophagus that is intended to represent Barrett's esophagus, which is this healing of the area with a different lining that is actually protective against acid that is refluxed up into the esophagus. So for those of us who have reflux symptoms, then the question is, um, is my reflux disease serious? And in general, uh, as I hope I've been able to show you, most people do not have serious problems or serious complications related to reflux disease. And the major way that we identify whether or not somebody may have serious reflux disease is related to the other symptoms that they may develop. So if with reflux disease you have difficulty swallowing, food seems to stick or catch on the way down, if you have pain when you swallow, or if you have nausea or vomiting, then these suggest that there may be more serious complications that need to be discussed with your physician and may need investigation. Any evidence of bleeding, that is vomiting blood or passing blood in stools or passing dark black stools that suggest that there may be some bleeding with digestion, all of these suggest that you should see your physician as should symptoms of weight loss, particularly if you're not meant to lose weight, or if you're anemic, which suggests that there may be some bleeding as well. So any of these would suggest that you should discuss this with your physician. Having said that, the vast majority of complications, symptoms, and issues related to reflux disease will respond very well to treatment. So can GERD be treated? And the answer to that is a resounding yes. Reflux disease can be treated very well for the vast majority of people. And in fact, most people don't need any tests or investigations before they start treatment. It's important to recognize that reflux disease is a chronic condition because it's related to the way that the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't close properly or opens at the wrong time and because it may be related to a hiatus hernia with uh, changes to the ligament or fibrous tissue that holds the esophagus in place, we don't have any medications that will cure reflux disease. Having said that, medical treatment is now known to be very safe and very effective. And in fact, surgical treatment for reflux disease is uncommon and is usually not necessary. It's very, very rare, for example, that I will refer anybody for surgery. So if treatment controls the symptoms and medical treatment controls symptoms with lifestyle changes, then quality of life improves dramatically. And I think that's one of the things that Sean told us earlier. And we also know that uh, long-term uh, injury and complications
conditions are very uncommon if, uh, um, if there is effective treatment. So treatment is good. So how do we treat? Well, the first thing is if you have symptoms that are troublesome and there are any concerns about it, then you need to discuss it with your physician. Uh, one of the first things that's often discussed is lifestyle changes, lifestyle choices that uh, may produce an improvement in symptoms, and that, avoid, that includes avoiding things that will commonly trigger the symptoms. And if there is significant overweight, then a program to lose weight will often be helpful. There are a number of the over-the-counter over medications that you can buy directly at your pharmacy that may be helpful in treating symptoms. but. For many people, those are not sufficient, and there is no point in continuing with over-the-counter medications if they're not producing an improvement in symptoms. And that's where we move on to prescription medications, the sort of things that your physician can prescribe. And the major classes of drugs that we look at here are, firstly, H2 blockers, H2 receptor antagonists, secondly, proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs, and then rarely there are uh, medications that change the motility of the esophagus and the stomach, and these are called motility agents or prokinetics. Endoscopic treatment is occasionally useful in specific circumstances, and as I mentioned, surgery is possible for reflux disease, but for most people it's unnecessary and it is probably more dangerous and no more effective than if medical treatment. But I'll, I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Now, in terms of the treatments that we're looking at, medical treatments are designed uh, either to decrease the reflux of food and liquid from the stomach to the esophagus, and that's where we're looking at lifestyle changes with smaller meals so that the stomach will empty more quickly, or these motility agents or prokinetics that will speed up gastric emptying. Now, these can be helpful to some extent, but in general, the most effective treatments are those that reduce the amount of acid in the stomach and therefore the amount of acid that can go back up into the esophagus and cause symptoms and damage. And the medications we're looking at there are either antacids, which are generally available over the counter, and these neutralize acid in the esophagus so that symptoms will improve quickly, or the other medications, the PPIs and the H2 blockers, that reduce the secretion of acid by the stomach so that there's less acid and less volume to go back up into the esophagus. So if we look first at lifestyle changes, these are really based around trying to reduce the amount of food in the stomach and the stimulus to acid in the stomach so that there is less to reflux back up into the esophagus. So avoiding large meals, avoiding meals or snacks for at least a couple of hours before bedtime, both of these are major things that will help in reducing symptoms. It may be helpful to avoid alcohol, spicy foods, and fatty meals, and that's because if these are reflux back up into the esophagus, they can irritate even more than the acid. And in some cases, just swallowing these, um, these, these drinks and foods can cause irritation on the way down, quite simply just because they do tend to be irritant. We've heard about raising the head of the bed, which may reduce nighttime reflux, and there are some studies that suggest it may be helpful to a little bit, but generally, um, it, um, it is not uh, a, a major benefit for most people unless there is a lot of regurgitation. And then for some people, losing weight or reducing the amount of food that is eaten will help to reduce reflux as well. So reflux changes or lifestyle changes are often recommended as the initial treatment for GERD, um, and it suggests that you do indeed have some control over managing a reflux disease. But although some people do get better with this, I would have to say that my experience is that most people continue to have symptoms despite the fact that uh, they've made these changes to their lifestyle. And the fact that they still have symptoms doesn't mean that they've failed with their lifestyle symptoms. It simply means that the reflux is troublesome enough or severe enough that it needs other treatments. So the next sort of treatments that we're looking at are these over-the-counter medications, antacids that neutralize acid in the esophagus and the stomach, and these can be available as liquids or quick-dissolving or chewable tablets. And as I've said, what they do is they neutralize acid so that there's less irritation and damage in the esophagus. They generally work very quickly within one to two minutes, but their action is short-lived, so they often will only last for a few minutes or maybe half an hour before the symptoms start to come back again if you have bad reflux. So they're generally not very effective for treating erosions or damage in the esophagus, and if you need to take large numbers of them, then they can also cause either diarrhea or constipation, which will make life even more miserable. So if 
antacids are not working, we're then looking at the class of medications known as H2 blockers or histamine H2 receptor antagonists. And these have been around now since the mid-1970s. The first one was cimetidine or tagamet. And this is a medication which works by reducing acid secretion in the stomach. And that little diagram over on the right-hand side shows that tagamet or the H2 blockers work by blocking the effect of histamine on the parietal cell, that is a little cell in the stomach, that secretes acid. And we generally have about a million of these cells sitting in our stomach, pumping out acid most of the time. And the H2 blockers go and they block one of these signals to the parietal cell and therefore reduce acid secretion. They generally work reasonably quickly within half an hour to three quarters of an hour, but again, their action is relatively short-lived, usually less than six to 10 hours. And although they help erosions and heal some of the damage in a proportion of people, they're generally less effective at healing more severe damage. And because of the way that they work, their effect tends to wear off over time. So after a few weeks of using H2 blockers, their effect is less evident, and the symptoms will often come back again. So they're not necessarily a great long-term solution to treating reflux disease and reflux symptoms. So the other major class of medications that we use that also reduce acid secretion are these medications called PPIs or proton pump inhibitors. And the reason they're called proton pump inhibitors is that they block the proton pump or acid pump that is in the parietal cell, that cell I told you about in the stomach. We have a million of these and each of these has lots and lots and lots of proton pumps or acid pumps that push acid out into the storage area of the cell called the canaliculus, and from there they're released into the stomach. And the proton pump or acid pump is blocked by these medications. So the medication goes, you swallow it, it goes into your bloodstream, it gets concentrated in the parietal cells, and it stops the pump from working for the, a few days and therefore produces reduction in acid and therefore reduces the damage that's caused by stomach contents refluxing up into the esophagus. Now the problem is that they don't generally work as quickly as the other medications, and their effect increases steadily over about three to seven days. But for most people, they, affect, they work for a relatively long period of time, up to 24 hours in many people, although in some people the effect will wear off before then so that people may get recurrent symptoms even if they're taking their proton pump inhibitor once a day. Having said that, they're very effective and they will generally heal erosions or damage in about 9 out of 10 or 19 out of 20 people. The other couple of medications that I want to mention briefly because they may be used on occasion are these motility agents or prokinetics. These are prescription medications in Canada and they're designed to speed up stomach emptying so that there's less food and less acid in the stomach to come back up into the esophagus. The other medication on this slide is sulcrate, uh, which is a liquid or a tablet that works as a protective agent. So it's, when you swallow it, it sort of coats the area that's inflamed or injured and allows it to heal a little more quickly. It's generally used with other medications, and on its own, it is really not much more effective than the H2 block, as I told you about before. So to summarize, there are a number of different medications that we've talked about. Over on the left-hand side, you can see that we have the antacids that you can buy over the counter at a pharmacy or a supermarket. And there are a number here that can be used. And in general, I would suggest that you take the one that tastes best and works best. The H2 blockers, there's a list of them that are available either by prescription or over the counter, cimetidine, famotidine, nizatidine, and Zantac. And we then come on in the middle to the proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs, Dexlansoprazole or Dexilant, Esomeprazole or Nexium, Lansoprazole or Prevacid, Omeprazole or Losec, Pantoprazole, which is called Pantaloc or Tecta, and then finally Robeprazole or Pariot. So these are all proton pump inhibitors. They're all available in Canada. And then we move on to the other two drugs that I told you about that sometimes are used in addition to acid suppression medication, the prokinetics, Domperidone or Motilium, and metoclopramide, also called Maxaran, and then over on the right-hand side, sulcrate or sucralfate. I wanted to mention briefly the endoscopic and reflux surgery. Surgery uh, is called anti-reflux surgery and may also be called fundoplication or a Nissen fundoplication. Um, and this is a surgical procedure in which the upper part of the stomach is 
freed up so that it can be wrapped around the bottom end of the esophagus, and that tightens up the bottom end of the esophagus so that food is less likely to go back up into the esophagus. The downside of this is it also makes it rather more difficult to swallow because it doesn't relax when you swallow, and therefore food can sometimes stick or catch on the way down. There have been a lot of advances with this surgery, and it's now often done as what's called laparoscopic or keyhole surgery so that there aren't big scars afterwards and it's possible to go home sooner after surgery. Having said this, surgery really is not necessary for the vast majority of people with reflux disease, and the big studies that have been done to compare medical and surgical therapy have not shown that surgery is better than medical treatment for the vast majority of reflux patients. And the other problem is that the benefits of surgery will generally wear off with time at about 3 to 5% per year, which means that 1 in 30 to 1 in 40 people with surgery for reflux disease will find that they need to restart medication within a year of having surgery, and that continues for every year thereafter. Endoscopic therapy. Um, to treat reflux disease has been tried for a number of different techniques over the last 10 to 20 years, and it, disappointingly, unfortunately, none of these techniques have been shown to be beneficial or effective in the long run. So endoscopic therapy now really is restricted to the treatment of Barrett's esophagus to try and avoid operations, and for those small proportion of people who need treatment for their Barrett's esophagus, um, then this is a very effective and safe way of dealing with Barrett's esophagus without the need to go to surgery. So moving on from that, uh, the next thing is if you have reflux symptoms, and I've suggested that if they're troublesome, you should go and see your doctor, the question is what should you tell your doctor? And as I know and as you know, you often have a long wait to see your doctor, and it's therefore important to make the most of the time that you have with your physician. A couple of tips about trying to communicate with your physician. Uh, the first one is that um, it's important that you are prepared when you go to see your physician, that you know what information you want to give him to describe your symptoms, what medication you take, and what makes your symptoms worse and better. It's very helpful if you're informed about reflux disease and the symptoms so that you know what it is that you're explaining and it makes life easier for you and for your physician. It's a good idea to have a reasonable expectation of what you want from your physician. Um, as we've talked about, it's not possible to cure reflux disease, but it is possible to improve symptoms and to reassure yourself that there aren't any serious problems. So if those are the concerns, then that is what it's important to talk to your doctor about and to let your doctor know what it is that you expect from the discussion around your reflux symptoms. And it really is important to emphasize that treating reflux disease is a partnership. It's your condition. You know what it feels like. You know the problems that it causes you. And if you can explain that to your physician and to your pharmacist, then they'll be better able to help you deal with your symptoms and let you get on with the rest of your life. So with that, what I hope I've done is to give you a whistle-stop tour through reflux disease, what causes it, why it happens, what the symptoms are, what are some of the things that you need to look for and how it can be treated and the fact that it can be treated very successfully for the vast majority of people. So I think with that, I'm going to hand back to Catherine. And um, like Sean, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have over the uh, rest of the seminar. That's wonderful, David. Thanks very much. Um, we have a couple of questions. There's um, two here that are related that are specific to young people. So the first question is, if a baby or toddler is diagnosed with GERD, will that child grow out of it as he or she ages? That's a, that's a tough question, and, and I can understand it's also a very worrying question if you have a child or a toddler who has reflux disease. Um, I think it's fair to say that we really don't know. Um, I think a proportion of children who have reflux will continue to have problems through the latter the next phases of their life, but that's certainly not true for everybody. Um, despite the fact that reflux disease is common, I have to say that there's a lot that we don't know about it. And one of the areas where we really don't have a lot of information is what happens to children with reflux disease and that they go on to become big refluxes. Um, I think the important thing through all of this is to make sure that the reflux disease is appropriately investigated 
and that it's well treated to try and minimize any long-term problems and try and deal with it in the long run. Okay. And then there's a part two to that question, which is, are there specific foods that help with digestion and GERD in toddlers and infants to lessen the chances of them having frequent vomiting and the symptoms of GERD? So I, I think there are a couple of things with that. One is that the general principles of eating um, that I talked about for adults with reflux disease also apply to children, which is that foods, uh, meals, big, um, bigger meals, uh, meals that may be more difficult to digest, heavy meals, fatty meals that empty more slowly from the stomach, are more likely to trigger acid reflux and therefore they're more likely to cause reflux. So small meals, frequent meals are probably an important part of this. Again, because reflux can occur at night time, then late evening snacks or big meals late at night uh, really should be avoided. And then the other thing is to explain to the child and talk to the child because they will often identify the foods that cause them symptoms. Uh, it's a learning process and that's a process of discussion. So I think really the important thing is to look for the foods that may trigger symptoms and to look at those and with the understanding that it is foods that empty slowly from the stomach, foods that are slowly digested that are more likely to cause problems. The other thing is that foods that may produce gas or cause bloating, uh, so diet, pops, and uh, candies can sometimes also make reflux worse because they cause gas and bloating, and that tends to slow gastric emptying as well. If there's a lot of vomiting, that's perhaps unusual with reflux disease, and it's worth discussing with a physician, again, whether there is some other reason why the, uh, why your child is vomiting. Okay, great. And the next question is for Sean, and this comes from Nigel, and he ask, asks, what was the fundamental lifestyle you made that enabled you to deal with GERD, aside from taking the PPI? <clears throat> yes, I, it, actually for me, there was the, the medication itself was a fundamental change uh, and, and in, the, in a positive sense, it opened up my lifestyle. The one thing that I had always found for me personally that worked was the food modification, so avoiding the late night, uh, the, the, the control of it, the, avoiding the later evening meals, avoiding the big meals. Definitely for me, things like red wine were a big trigger. Um, so there were a lot of trigger foods for me. Um, uh, what I liked about the medication was the medication allowed me to ignore those concerns, and that was a huge change for me. Okay, thanks. Thanks. The next one is from Pamela, and it says, I take a PPI nightly, and I get very bad, a uh, very bad nauseating feeling where I actually have to stop moving and talking and sometimes actually vomiting. Why would that be, and what can I do to stop it? Unusual. Um, so you take the PPI at nighttime, and so uh, let me think about this one. So generally PPIs... Uh, have very little in the way of side effects, um, and it's rare for them to cause um, stomach pains or anything else. In a very small proportion of patients uh, that I've seen, taking a PPI can cause increased stomach motility and sometimes can cause cramps, so it may affect uh, stomach feelings. Um, so if it's related to the PPI, then um, it may be worth looking to switch to a different PPI or to take it at a different time of day. Now, generally for reflux disease, even if it's nighttime reflux, what we suggest is to take the PPI in the morning before breakfast, about 30 minutes before breakfast or before you would have breakfast, and then if you're still having nighttime symptoms, to take a second dose in the evening, either half an hour before an evening meal or if it's more helpful, about half an hour before going to bed. Now, if you do that, it may be possible to take a lower dose twice a day and still have the same effect as taking it once a day, and that may be sufficient to uh, reduce the symptoms and the nausea that uh, appear to be related to taking the medication. If you symptoms still carry on with that, I think it's important to talk to your physician and make sure that there isn't something else going on in your stomach that's causing the the, the nausea and the stomach pains because it is possible that there may be something else like an ulcer uh, that is causing the symptoms because that's a little unusual for reflux disease on its own. Okay, great. And the next question is, is there a way for me to tighten the LES so that I no longer have problems with GERD? 
Wouldn't that be nice? Um, unfortunately, there isn't. Um, it's as I said before. We're not. We really don't know why the LES becomes loose. Um, and in fact, in many cases, it's not that the LES, the lower esophageal sphincter, is loose or weak. It's because it opens up at inappropriate times. And it may be a combination of that and a hiatus hernia that then leads to the reflux. So unfortunately, there aren't any medications uh, that will tighten up the LES. Um, there was actually a lot of research over the last five to 10 years trying to find medications that would slow or reduce relaxations of the LES, but unfortunately, at least one of those medications uh, is no longer being developed because it was associated with some side effects, and the other one is probably still um, a couple of years away from market if it comes through. But it may be that in the future there will be medications that will reduce the sensitivity of the LES. Um, other than that, it's really a question of trying to work with the other things around life. Uh, with smaller meals, uh, making sure that the stomach isn't full so that that doesn't trigger the opening of the LES and then trigger the reflux that occurs afterwards. Okay. And the next question is from Keith, and he's asking how smoking affects GERD. So how does smoking affect GERD? Um, actually, there's very little in, there's very little evidence that smoking affects reflux disease directly. That is not to say that you should smoke. Um, it's just that most of the studies have not shown that smokers are more likely to get reflux than non-smokers. There is a caveat or a warning around that because for those patients who have reflux disease and particularly those who have Barrett's, then smoking is associated with an increased risk of developing Barrett's esophagus and developing esophageal cancer. But the smoking itself doesn't seem to affect the lower esophageal sphincter. There are many, many other reasons why you shouldn't smoke for heart disease, lung disease, um, blood vessel disease, bladder cancer, lung cancer. There are many, many reasons why not to smoke. But reflux disease is one of the very small areas where it's not a reason to stop smoking. Thank you. So the next one is from Anne, and she says, once my symptoms have been reduced from taking the PPI, do I need to continue taking it? That's a very common question, and it really goes back to what I said before about reflux disease being a chronic disease. So the mechanisms that lead to reflux will not be cured and will not go away as a result of a course of medication that has reduced acid and allowed the symptoms to resolve and possibly caused healing. So for most people, they will need to continue medication but that doesn't mean necessarily that everybody needs to continue taking medication every day. We've done studies in Canada which showed that if people have taken medication every day for between 4 and 16 weeks, and that has been sufficient to bring their symptoms under control, that a proportion of people can then stop their medication. So when these patients in the study stopped their medication, about half of them had their symptoms back within a week to 10 days. So these are people who need to restart their medication and will probably need to take medication regularly from that point forward to keep their reflux under control. Having said that, there was about one in five to one in 10 people who did not need to restart their medication for six months afterwards. So not everybody has to continue with the medication all of the time, but there is a reasonably high probability that they will have to. The best way to find out Providing that you haven't got evidence of Barrett's esophagus or damage, then the best way to find out is to take a course of treatment for 6, 8, 10, 12 weeks until the symptoms are under control. And then at some point that's convenient is to try and stop the medication for a few days and see what happens to your symptoms. And if your symptoms don't come back for days, weeks, or months, then you probably don't need to carry on. If you just get occasional symptoms, then you can take the medication for the days when you have the symptoms and providing that's only once or twice a week, then that's a reasonable strategy that's called on-demand therapy. If you're one of the lucky ones in whom the symptoms have gone away for a long time, then in principle you don't need to take the medication. So it's really a question of trial and error for yourself to work out how best to deal with this. Okay. And the next question is from Lisa, and she says, can you develop asthma as a result of having GERD? This, again, has been one of the interesting questions over the last 20 to 30 years. 
Um, asthma is a very common condition, and reflux is a very common condition. Um, and it, the problem is that it may actually go both ways. Uh, there was a study from Chicago probably about 10, 15 years ago in patients with asthma which showed that they had an increased risk of reflux disease, which may have been related to repetitive coughing and damage to the, um, to the diaphragm, allowing a hiatus hernia to develop. So asthma may cause reflux. Similarly, people who get reflux, particularly if there's a lot of regurgitation, may get stomach contents coming up into the back of the throat and causing irritation, which then causes wheezing. So they're related to each other. I think it's generally accepted that most people with asthma, it's not caused by reflux. And most people with reflux, it's not caused by asthma. But in a small proportion of cases, bad reflux, particularly if there's regurgitation, can make respiratory symptoms worse and can make asthma worse. Okay. And then we have... Another, there's actually two questions I'm going to put into one, and the first one is, is GERD related to H. pylori, and is there a connection between GERD and celiac disease? Good. So thanks for putting those together, because I'm going to separate them out again. Um, <laughs> but that's fine. So gastroesophageal reflux disease and Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori is a bacterium that infects the stomach. Um, it was discovered or rediscovered by two Australians called Barry Marshall and Robin Warren uh, probably about 30 years ago, and they showed that it caused stomach inflammation and ultimately that it causes stomach ulcers, gastric ulcers, duodenal ulcers, and can lead on to gastric cancer. And that, they got a Nobel Prize for that about five years ago, and it's made a huge difference to gastroenterology. So Helicobacter is a stomach infection that can be cured with antibiotics, and it causes stomach and duodenal problems. There is very little evidence that it actually causes reflux disease. Um, a number of studies have tried to show this, and it's pretty clear that Helicobacter doesn't cause reflux disease. There has been concern that Helicobacter may protect against reflux disease because inflammation caused by Helicobacter will affect the stomach will reduce acid secretion and will therefore make reflux symptoms less troublesome because there's less acid to come up into the esophagus. So there's a theory that we should not be treating Helicobacter because it may make reflux worse. Having said that, there have been several very large studies which have shown in patients with reflux disease and in patients who do not have reflux disease that curing Helicobacter does not cause reflux disease, and it doesn't make reflux disease worse in these very, very big studies. So I think the bottom line is that although there's a lot written about this, um, Helicobacter does not cause reflux disease, and Helicobacter cure doesn't cause reflux disease either. Celiac disease is a little different. Celiac disease is much less common. So Helicobacter infection in Canada affects about one in four adults. Celiac disease affects about one in 100 people in Canada and in North America. And celiac disease is a condition in which the body has developed an allergy or immune response to wheat products, and in particular the gliadin or gluten part of wheat. And the gluten then causes inflammation and injury in the small bowel um, that can cause diarrhea, can cause weight loss, and can cause anemia. There are some studies now which suggest that this inflammation may slow gastric emptying and may therefore make reflux disease more likely um, in a small proportion of people with reflux disease. Now, this has not been proven, um, but there are some case reports, that is, some isolated cases from people with celiac disease in whom treatment of the celiac disease going on what's called a gluten-free diet in which people don't eat any wheat products will lead to an improvement in reflux symptoms. So there are some data to suggest that celiac disease may make reflux worse and that a strict adherence, strictly following a gluten-free diet, may improve reflux symptoms. But as I said, that's only really a small proportion of the overall population. Okay, great. And then there's actually the same question from several people, and that is, is there any naturopathic um, type of remedies that can be used to control GERD? 
So this is really getting outside my area of, of knowledge. Um, I think I would say, from my point of view, I'm not aware of any naturopathic treatments that will improve reflux disease. Um, and there, there are a couple of things I would say about that. One is what I described at the start of my presentation about reflux disease explained our widespread understanding about the effects and importance of acid, pepsin, this digestive enzyme, stomach emptying, um, lower esophageal sphincter uh, motility, esophageal motility, and hiatus hernia as reasons why people get reflux disease and get reflux symptoms. And the medications that we use are designed to target specific abnormalities in that series of causes of reflux disease. I'm not aware that any of the naturopathic remedies have been tested for reflux disease, and I'm not aware that they actually have a specific effect on any of those mechanisms. Now, having said that, I'm, I'm not a nihilist and I don't poo-poo things, so if somebody is taking a naturopathic medicine that improves their reflux symptoms, uh, that keeps them under control, then it's not my job to change something that's working. My suspicion and my experience with most people is that it doesn't work and therefore it's important to go on to use medications that we know are effective and we know how they work and we know that the risk of side effects or complications from those treatments is very, very small. There is a theory that, and, and some naturopathic doctors will subscribe to this, that reflux disease is actually due to a lack of acid in the stomach and that what we should be doing is taking more acid to try and stop the reflux disease. And I really do not believe that at all. All of the information that we have, all of the treatment studies in, hundreds, you know, in thousands and thousands and thousands of patients across the world, uh, all of the investigations that we've done have shown that it is acid and pepsin with acid that produces the symptoms and the, the damage, and that the healing of erosions, the regression of Barrett's, the prevention of Barrett's is associated with treatments that reduce acid. So my take on this is that I've got no proof that any of the naturopathic remedies work. And secondly, the theory that reflux disease is due to a deficiency of acid is actually just wrong. Okay. Erica would like to know if if a headache from taking a PPI is a concerning side effect. PPIs are generally considered to be very safe with very little risk of um, adverse symptoms or problems. Um, a headache is one of the side effects that has been described for a small proportion of people taking proton pump inhibitors or PPIs. I'm not aware of any serious problems associated with headaches uh, that occur with proton pump inhibitors. So the first thing about that then is I don't think it's anything of concern. Having said that, it's unusual for a PPI to cause headaches. It's not impossible, but it's unusual. And so it's important to make sure that there isn't another cause for the headaches. It is also well worth considering trying a different PPI or a different treatment because they're not identical. And even if one PPI causes a headache, it's possible that another one may not. And the aim of treating reflux disease, like the aim of treating anything else, is to make you feel better. So to have a medication which gets rid of the reflux to make you feel better and then gives you a headache so that you feel worse uh, is not necessarily a great trade-off. Does that answer the question? Yes, that's great. There's another question here asking if GERD could be causing the enamel of the teeth to be damaged. There are a number of conditions that have been associated with reflux disease over the last few years, and they include the suggestion that reflux may be associated with ear infections, with sinusitis, and with damage to teeth and loss of dental enamel. 
as far as we know, these are relatively uncommon and they're not proven. Having said that, there is a particular pattern of loss or damage to dental enamel that seems to be associated with reflux, and that's generally associated actually with regurgitation. It's the regurgitation and reflux of stomach contents, acid, and pepsin into the back of the throat and the mouth, and that then produces or is thought to produce damage to the enamel on the inside of the teeth. So it's a pattern of enamel loss that is different from the normal cavities and caries uh, that are seen in most people. So if the dentist says that this is a loss of enamel around the inside of the teeth, and there's no other reason for that related to sucking candies or eating um, acidic foods or acidic drinks, then it's possible that it is reflux related and it may be worth further investigation to see if there is reflux that may respond to treatment. Okay, great. We'll just do two more questions. Um, one is, is, with the reduction of stomach acid by the PPI medication, how does this affect the digestion of food? So this is, again, is, is uh, an important question, and it's one that people uh, are obviously very worried about. Um, there are, there are a couple of points, I think, that are important to remember. Um, I talked about the stomach producing acid and also producing pepsin, which is a digestive enzyme, and it is well known that the pepsin plays a role in starting the digestion, particularly of proteins. However, it is possible to digest food completely without the use of pepsin or without the pepsin being necessary to start the digestion. So there are people who are able to digest food even if they've had their stomach removed completely. The second point is that although even the, the strong proton pump inhibitors that are very good at reducing acid, even those medications do not get rid of acid all of the time completely throughout the day. So there are periods during the day, even in people who are taking proton pump inhibitors twice or three times a day, there are periods during the day when there is sufficient acid and sufficient pepsin in the stomach to start digestion and generally to clear away and sterilize most of the food and get rid of the bacteria. So it may take away a little bit of the digestion, but for most people who are otherwise well, then the rest of the digestive system is fully capable of taking over uh, the slight loss of digestive activity in the stomach, and it will not lead to any malabsorption or malnutrition or weight loss. Okay, great. And this will be the final question for tonight. And just before we ask this, I just want to remind everybody that all of the questions that, we'll, that were submitted, we will make sure that there are answers for them. They will just be in printed form, so please make sure that you check back on the website for that. So the final question is, I just got I just had an endoscopy done, and my physician says that everything is normal. However, I have heartburn and constant belching. Is it possible that I'm suffering from GERD, or should I be asking questions about something else? So the likelihood is that you're suffering from reflux disease. And the reason I say that is actually related to one of the slides that I showed, which is that only about half of the people with reflux disease have an abnormality that can be seen at endoscopy. The other 50 to 60% of people who have typical reflux symptoms have what is called NERD or non-erosive reflux disease. That is, they have reflux disease, it's just that the reflux has not been sufficient to cause damage even though it causes very troublesome symptoms. So the likelihood is that you do have reflux disease the likelihood is that you will do well with anti-reflux treatment and with the lifestyle changes that go with that if they're helpful as well. Um, it doesn't by any means need that you need to go looking for other conditions. Uh, and in most people, typical symptoms of reflux disease mean that you have reflux disease even if the investigations are normal. And that's why I said at the start, most people with reflux symptoms actually don't need investigations. Now, there are some very rare conditions uh, which cause inflammation in the esophagus or cause sensitivity in the esophagus, producing conditions known as non-cardiac chest pain or nutcracker esophagus or 
eosinophilic esophagitis that can cause esophageal symptoms that are not due to reflux disease. But these are very much less common, and the best thing to do is for typical reflux symptoms is to treat it as reflux even if the endoscopy is normal. If the symptoms settle, then you have reflux disease. If the symptoms do not respond at all to medication taken once daily or twice daily, then that's the time at which it's reasonable to look for another diagnosis. Okay, that's great. On behalf of the Canadian Digestive Health Foundation, I would like to thank Sean Richards and Dr. Armstrong for sharing their insights and expertise with us and extend our very special thanks to you who have joined us as participants for this session. We hope that you feel that you've been empowered to live your life successfully with GERD with the information you've been given.